So this is lesson six, and uh, and let me go ahead and start us off with prayer here tonight. Gracious Lord, we do praise you for your word, and you do call us to listen to your word. Help us to hear what you would speak to us tonight. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for protecting and presenting your word to us. We thank you for the great privilege of having your word in our own language and that we can study it in peace and safety tonight. What a gift. Illumine our minds, Lord, that we might hear and understand, and in understanding, grow in faith and obedience. To better bear the image of the Son of God. We give thanks for this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, little little test question. Uh, well, um, does anybody remember back the first session, the introduction? That was five weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I talked about how I'm using this uh, structure of a chiasm to organize the book. And how there's different different people had different ideas about how the book was organized. Okay. So we did the introduction. We did the brevity of time section. We had talked about wisdom's failure and limitation. Last week we talked the poem about time. Right, turn, turn, turn. And so now we're going to get to the meat of the book. This is the big high point of the book. And this is about fearing God. And so tonight, the next three weeks are really in the center section of the book. This is the this is the what the book is the big point of the book. It's about fearing God and this, this center section, we're going to take about three weeks to go over. And he's going to give us warnings. We're going to get multiple warnings about different things that would trip us up from fearing God and walking with God. Tonight, we're going to talk about oppression, competition at work, and politics, of all things. And, uh, and so this is just, uh, just so you see the context here of the book. So... This is the big turning point now where he, after all this vanity, after all this absurdity, he's going to talk about fearing God in the certainty of judgment after death. And we have to live in light of that. And so now he's going to start talking about very practical issues in this life under the sun that's full of vanity and absurdity. How, they're, they're basically warnings for us. We'll start that tonight. Now, we, um, we've we talked also about multiple themes in the book. Well, tonight, guess what? You're going to hear about our lot in life. Our lot in life. God's given us a lot in life. The certainty of death and judgment. It runs through the whole book. And then guess what? <laughs> we've seen this one before, too. This idea that the response of faith and fearing God is enjoying the pleasures of life. It's it's not throwing up your hands and go hide, you know, pulling the covers over your head or or, or whatever, or despairing. It's enjoying, it's trusting God and, and and enjoying what He's given us to do and the pleasures of that. Now we've uh, about every week we've talked about some kind of a song in here this week, and uh, I thought this week. Uh, uh, this week's kind of talking about the real world, the real world, okay? And the real world's a rough place we're going to see under the sun tonight. So I thought about the Alan Jackson song. No, but I'm not getting any re uh, Alan oh, Jackson. Oh, yeah. Did he write one to his mother? No, <laughs> he's talking about he's talking about uh, 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 but love in the real world. It's not like Hollywood. Right. And it's been the real world. Nobody got it tonight. I'll have to do better well, next week. No, no, no. That would be that'd be the end of the class right there. Yeah. That'd be the end of the class. Here in the real world, I think it's the name of the song. Here in the real world, my lovely assistant may have that for us here. Well, maybe we'll uh, end this end the session with that. Okay, but we're going to be talking about the real world, and it's a rough place. Now, last week. Again, I got, got to get you to think back now. It was a week ago. The birds. The birds. Turn, turn, turn. We did Ecclesiastes 3. 
there's a time for this, there's a time for that, there's a time for this, there's a time for that. And I told you at the end of the lesson last week, there was one thing it didn't talk about, but there's a time for it. So we're going to start there, and, uh, and that'll be in Ecclesiastes uh, 3.14. We're going to start on that. But um, so God's going to talk about uh, dealing with these things tonight. And there's a call here. There's a call here to live in faith. This book, I said in the introduction, this book is a call to faith in an absurd, vain world and to trust him by living differently than what everything that's going on in an absent, absent in an absurd, vain world, okay? So let's pick it up, and uh, I'm going to read uh, 13 to 3, 14 to 21. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there's nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. That which is has already has been already, and that which will be has already been, for God seeks what has passed by. Furthermore, I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there is wickedness, and in the place of righteousness there is wickedness. I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time for every matter and every deed is there. I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so the other, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. All go to the same place, all came from the dust, and all return to the dust. Who knows what the breath of man that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beast descends downward to the earth? Okay, so there's a lot here, but the upshot here is as he's this transition from talking about the times and the seasons to talking about fearing God. The big upshot here is in verse uh, 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 17, where he talks about. A time for every matter and for every deed is there. And he's talking about judgment. This is this is this is where he starts to look out beyond what's under the sun. He's looking out beyond what happens at death. Uh, for, uh, let me let me hit a couple points up here in fourteen and fifty. Everything God does will remain forever, and there's nothing to add to it, and there's nothing to take from it. For God has said work that men should fear him. So all these things we've talked about the last five weeks, this absurdity in the world, all these different times and come and go and cycle through our lives, God has a purpose behind all these things. That's what he's saying here. There's a purpose to it. Verse 14, we can't add, we can't add to it. We can't take away. We're not in control. Right? Wouldn't, we, wouldn't you like to be in control and say, this is going to happen in my life, and it's going to happen like this. It's going to be smooth sailing, and it's just going to be great. Right? There's no human agency here. We are dependent creatures on God's will. And what he establishes and all, everybody in here could tell their life story and talk about the ups and downs and twists and turns and the plot that God's used to get you here. Right? And uh, all of that is God's doing to shape you and, could, and, and bring you to faith and to fear him. That's his purpose, he says there in verse 14. So work that men should fear him. Even, even in a world that we've talked about that looks insane and out of control and absurd and vain, God's still sovereign over all those times and over all of his means that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. Um, and, we, and we don't get to change any of it. 
Um, and then verse 16 there, I've seen, remember, the preacher, remember, he doesn't hear, he sees, right? He's, he's investigating, he sees. I have seen under the sun that in the place of justice there's wickedness, and in the place of righteousness there's wickedness. So this whole world under the sun is absurd. Where there should be justice, there's wickedness. Where there should be righteousness, there's wickedness. And we're going to go on here. Again, remember, always remember back to Genesis, uh, first three chapters of Genesis. Man's created to bear the image of the Son of God, uh, uh, bear the image of God. So how absurd that creatures that are bearing the image of God are being mistreated and dealt with with injustice and oppression and, and without righteousness. That's absurd. That's vanity. Who he's talking about. So verse 17 is where kind of the big hinge here for, for the uh, text. And I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. So this is a statement of faith. This is a statement looking beyond death because we've said in this, this world under the sun, justice doesn't always happen. The bad guys win sometimes. Justice, uh, injustice is not always punished. We don't get to see that. But he's saying in faith, beyond death, there is a certainty of God's judgment. Every deed, every matter. That... First of all, without Christ, if you're without Christ, that should make you tremble. Every deed, everything you've said, every matter in your life is going to be under his judgment. For the Christian, if you place your faith in Christ, you have the promise that he has um, declared you righteous and declared you innocent. And that he's going to reward you for acts of righteousness. There's, so the promise of judgment here is not only a punishment, but a reward. So uh, going on to verse 18 here. It's our old theme. It's our old theme, right? He's going to keep this in our face. He's going to keep this in our face. And I said to myself, here he goes again, I said to myself, Concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts, that they are mortal. God puts us through all these ups and downs and trials and tribulations to convince us, help us understand when we are quick to forget that we're mortal. We're created beings who we have a finite time on this earth and that we're mortal and we're not in control of our lives. All, the, all those things that God has taken you through are to remind you, and we need reminding, we want to be king of our life, right? And we'll run this show, thank you very much. No, all those things that God's taken you through and has taken you through right now are to remind you that you're a created being with a finite time on the earth. The certainty of death and of judgment. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. Right? They're all going to die, right? Our dog died. Someday I'm going to die. Right? It's, it's, we, we should learn from that. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they're all the same breath, and there's no advantage for man over beast. All is vanity. Finite time on the earth. Certainty of death. All go to the same place. All came from the dust, and all return to the dust. And then he, he pokes this question in our face here. He sticks this right in our face. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beast descends downward to the earth? Life under the sun, lit without fear of God, says death is death. I don't have to account for my uh, sins, whatever I did. But he's sticking that little reminder to us that, and what happens after death? That's what he's saying with that verse here. All right, we're going to jump 22. We're going to come back to 22 that, uh, uh, to sum things up here. 
So now, he's, sorry, say it, but he's, he's done it to us again, right? You're going to die. It's vanity. You're living in an absurd world. Death is certain. But now he's going to, this is where the book starts to turn. Uh, like we saw in verse 17, the, cer the certainty not only of death, but now of judgment after death. Because if there's judgment after death, then, then all your life under the sun has a meaning. It has purpose. It counts. i got to tell this story. My youngest son, um, the older two kids did real well in high school academically and some other things. And the third one decided that he wasn't going to really compete as hard. Okay, So he kind of bobs through, uh, through high school. And he goes to college, and all of a sudden, the grades go up. He's on the dean's list. <laughs> and I said, well, what's up? He said, well, this counts. <laughs> <laughs> this counts. There's money involved. There's jobs involved. Okay. This counts, see? When there was something at the end of the road, then everything in the path to get there mattered. This is what it's going this is what scripture's telling us now. If you know there's judgment after death, then everything, every moment of your life under the sun, it's a big deal. It has purpose, it has meaning. Because, like he said in verse 13, uh, 17. Every deed and every matter is going to be settled. It's going to come under judgment. If there's no judgment after death, party on and do whatever I want. But the certainty that God's eternal, the certainty that we have an eternal soul, and the certainty that there's going to be a judgment and every matter is going to get dealt with, that's a different game. So our grades, like my son, our grades are going to go up, right? All right. So now he's going to start warning us in these, in these like I said, in these next three weeks in this text we're going to go over. He's going to start warning us about the traps in life that would get us off track from fearing God. Okay? So I'm going to read these. Uh, I'm going to go from uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 to 16. And we're going to... What version are you? I'm reading NES, NES uh, New American Standard, okay. 1977. Got it? Okay, here we go. Then I looked again. Here he is searching, he's looking. And I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed, and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who were already dead more than the living who were still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Verse 4. Now he's going to shift gears. And I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after wind. The fool folds his hand and consumes his own flesh. One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. Then I looked again at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all of his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, For whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. And if either of them falls, the one who lifts up his companion the one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. 
cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Verse 13, another shift. A poor yet wise lad is better than an old and foolish king who no longer knows how to receive instruction. For he has come out of prison to become king, even though he was born poor in his kingdom. I've seen all the living under the sun thronged to the side of the second lad who replaces him. There's no end to all the people, to all who were before them, and even the ones who will come later will not be happy with him, for this too is vanity in striving after wind. All right, so a lot of stuff here. So the first thing he's going to warn us about is oppression. And I said before that, you know, in some of the arguments about who wrote the book, if this is Solomon, this is kind of a strange thing for him to talk about, right? Because who, who's the king if it's Solomon? And I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. Well, who's allowing the acts of oppression to go on? Who's the king? And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So where's Solomon on all this if he's the king? Right? There, there's not much empathy here. And there's certainly no, it doesn't seem like any intervention on the behalf of the oppressed. So this is one of the arguments that maybe it really isn't, you know, it's somebody with Solomon's persona, right? Okay. So I congratulated the dead. So he says, this is so bad that I'm going to congratulate the dead who are already dead because they don't have to put up with it anymore. And it's even better if somebody's not born because so they don't have to see all the evil activity that's done under the sun. Oppression so bad, it's better not to even be born that you'd have to see what men are doing to men. That's what he's saying here. Uh, I'm a history nut, and a lot of history is the documentation of man, uh, men being unkind to other men, right? And that's what Solomon's saying here, is oppression. Oppression under the sun. Anybody oppressed today in our world? Lots of refugees in various places of the world. Uh, people being oppressed because of religious uh, uh, beliefs in various parts of the world. Um, so our, our world doesn't lack any oppression here. But in Solomon's time, it was just, that was a standard of living. Because even Jesus says in, in, when he's uh, praying to God, give us our daily bread. Because that's all you you worked your whole day to get daily bread. You didn't work and then get weeks. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I mean. Uh, oppression and living like that was just a normal standard of living. Our our lifestyle is very unique in the history of mankind, right? That's what Paul said. Most of, I mean, the uh, in in Jesus's time, there's various estimates, but somewhere between fifty to seven percent. 70% of the population was you were either a slave or a servant which was half a notch above a slave. Yeah, you okay. were living on that daily bread. You were living on the edge, okay? And there weren't any labor laws, right? And there wasn't any uh, some agency that was going to intervene on your behalf. Yeah. Okay? Well, we've got some of those things and we still have oppression, right? In, in various forms in, in this country. So oppression <laughs> all around us and so the question I pose to you tonight is, does oppression move you? Solomon said, or the preacher said, it's better, it's so bad what people are doing to each other, it'd be better not to be, be born so you wouldn't have to see it. Does, does oppression move you? It, it it depends. The reason I say it depends is because, and I'm going to jump way ahead, is if we're at this point in time, and we are where we may understand the scriptures indicate the end of days or somewhere in that proximity, then it's supposed to happen like this. 
that the time's short and Jesus is coming quickly to put an end to it. Well, uh, that and and God says the scriptures say that man <clears throat> will turn away from Him towards the end. In fact, is that's why He brings on the tribulation is try to get man's attention drawn back to God because man is slowly but surely walking away from God, and as he does that, then that oppression is just going to be more and more. Well, yeah, so, so let me, I think I'm tracking. So think back, if we're going to jump to Revelation, so think about uh, Revelation 17 and 18 and the representation of Babylon, right? Yeah. And... They're selling people as slaves, yeah. right? You know, there's human trafficking going on there. And, and there's been human trafficking going on through most of uh, human history. Yep. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of what Solomon's talking about here. Um, but does it move us? You know, have, is, is there any, and the question I was going to leave you with tonight, you know, is there, is there anything that you, around you, that you can help stand up for somebody that needs it? Or is there some intervention that you might need to do on behalf of somebody else? That's the thing I was going to ask you to think about tonight. Is it, are there, uh, you know, are there unsettled accounts in your own life? Remember Jesus said, you know, before you pray, go off and be reconciled. You know, are there things like that where some might be say, someone might be saying you're oppressing them? bill that's not paid or some broken relationship or something i just ask you to think about it this way but you see what the preacher's saying to you, that this you know it's so bad it's better not to have had to have seen it it's like an extra you know we we kind of, we you know we know that certain things are going on around us in this world it's kind of like an x-rated movie you get so used to seeing it it doesn't offend you anymore that's that's the point I want you to think about tonight. He's, so he's talking about the fear of God means that you've got to stand for righteousness. You've got to stand against injustice is what this piece of scripture is talking about here tonight. Um, and I, I, I didn't write them in the notes, but uh, Matthew 5, 22 and 24 in the, in the Sermon on the Mount is where Jesus is talking about um, not tolerating, you know, making sure that you're reconciled, making sure you're right with other people, that you've given forgiveness where you need to give forgiveness. Okay, so so being just to fear God then is to live in just, uh, to insist on justice is what this passage is talking about. Let me let me pivot now and go to uh, verse four. Okay, now this is going to sound really familiar. And I've seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after win. Anybody ever done performance reviews? Okay, at least in the outfit I worked for, I mean, it was extremely competitive uh, in terms of oppor future opportunities, in terms of pay, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Extremely competitive, and Solomon says this too is vanity and striving after wind. And and I, the way I'm going to interpret it, this is ex rivalry to the point where you're willing to cut somebody other somebody else's throat and get ahead. Okay, there's always going to be a certain amount of competition and evaluation, but to the point. Well, you're willing to step on somebody else. Get ahead. That's what he's talking about. Now, he says there's two ways to respond to that. One is to be intensely competitive. And then the other one that we've seen before is fool who just stays in bed and pulls the covers over his head. And the fool holds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Consumes his own flesh means that he, he starves to death because he won't get up and work, okay? So there's two ways to respond to this competition, is to be cutthroat, or the other extreme is to just withdraw completely and don't work. And I looked under it again, 
I looked again and vanity under the sun. And he's going to tell this story again now that we, we saw a couple of chapters back. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all of his labor. This guy's a workaholic. He has no one to leave any of his wealth to. He's just working to gain wealth and for the sake of working. Anybody been a workaholic before? All right. I'm, yeah. I'm, look, I'm raising my hand. I'm raising my hand. Okay. I'm raising my hand. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked. Remember, we talked about this before. For whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity and a grievous task. So he's working just for the sake of work <laughs> and accumulating wealth. Yeah, but some of us enjoy work. Working is pleasure. Okay. It, but he's warning about excess. He's warning about excess and, and, hoard, and, and being driven by hoarding wealth. So this, he's gonna, now he's going to shift. He's going to talk about an opposite way to approach this. But this idea of excessive competition is what he's saying is vanity. Now, this <laughs> next section, a lot of times this gets applied to marriage. Because um, it's talking about you know, two working in partnership. But and and it and it does apply to marriage, but the bigger the bigger point here is to work in cooperation rather than to work in cutthroat competition. That's the bigger point. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. <laughs> if eat for if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's no not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? So the point here is if you got two people working together, they can manage risk, right? So if, if, if one guy could get taken down by an enemy, it's a lot harder with two. They can manage risk together. They can spread the work. They can keep each other warm. They can comfort each other. They can encourage each other. And in verse 12, if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And so the point here is cooperation. It's learning to work, fearing God, learning to work in cooperation rather than doing nothing, which is wrong, and, you know, cutting the throat of, of the people around you so you can get ahead. So he's calling, he's calling for cooperation here. And this last verse, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard this preach, two can re, a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. And so, you know, this is frequently interpreted as two people, you know, usually in marriage as two people with, with God, okay? It's, that, that's okay, but the, the, the other way to think of this, this is a poetic way of emphasizing the point. Remember in the Proverbs, a lot of times two is this, but three is this. Okay, that's what the point is. It's, it's emphasizing cooperation, the value and the power of cooperation rather than cutthroat competition. I mean, don't, aren't we, this, this again in our society, the Greeks were the ones that were the big competitors, right? They're the ones that started the races and, and all, all this, this competition uh, ethic that's in our society can kind of tie it back mostly to the Greek. <laughs> but we're eating up with it. Think, I mean, just listen to the, the news and the sports and uh, you name it, um, you know, the competition that we've built into our society. And we're kind of, we get kind of used to that, right? But scripture is telling us to stand back and look for opportunities to co for cooperation. I think one of the powerful things about this church is the emphasis on consensus uh, over and over again. When there's some issue that we talk it through and we pray it through and we get to some sort of unity and consensus rather than voting and saying, okay, you got six votes and you got five, so we're going to do it this way. 
in our churches has worked hard and continues to work hard at finding cooperation and consensus. And that's what he's warning us about here is the, the fear of God means that you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have to manage this issue and find a way to manage it so it builds up other people rather than trying to destroy people in competition. That he says that's vanity. Now, think about our Protestant work ethic. I thought about this week. You know, one of the you know, one of the big historical points about the whole Reformation is the emergence of what's known as the Protestant work ethic. Most of us have been raised with that, that um, most Protestant faiths uh, put a strong effort on, on you know, uh, working hard and, uh, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness and strong work ethic and take care of yourself and, and support your family and all that. And that has a biblical emphasis, basis in everything, but it can be taken too far. And I think that's that's part of the warning here tonight. Any other thoughts on that? Well, Paul, some of this is getting personal, you know. No, just Paul says the same thing. Everything in moderation. Balance. He's yeah, talking balance. about balance. He's talking about balance here. And this is this again, he's I'm getting ahead of myself. He's gonna tie it in to enjoying life and enjoying the pleasures that, that that's a gift from God. All right, another thing he's going to warn us about tonight is politics. It's an election year. I just thought it'd be exciting. All right, so read this. And uh, uh, I was thinking today how how uh, close to home this is. A poor yet wise lad is better than an old and foolish king. Who can no longer who no longer knows how to receive instruction? Both of our kings for election are old. <laughs> <laughs> Good at receiving instruction, the other one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but, but so the thing he's describing now. You, so you got an old king who apparently can't hear or listen or won't hear or listen, and he is usurped. By this uh, this poor, and it says yet wise lad. Okay, so he's poor. So he's come from. Uh, remember, one of the themes of the book is uncertainty in life. Okay, you can't predict things. So this, I'll call him the kid. The poor yet wise lad has come out of nowhere. He's come from a, a, a an unexpected background. Okay, and he's going to usurp the old king, who can't receive instruction. And in fact, he's he's so uncertain that he's come out of prison to become king, even though he was born poor in his kingdom. So life is so absurd under the sun that the most the 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 the, the, the person you would at least expect to be the king, some poor kid that came out of a prison. Okay, you can kind of think about Joseph here. Okay, um, the even though he was born poor, he now is going to be the king. He has deposed the old king, okay? Now look at verse 15. And I've seen all the living under the sun thronged to the side of the second lad who replaces him. So you had the old king. You had the kid that came out, the poor kid that came out of prison. And now you got a third one that you didn't see coming who's pushed him aside to be the king. Uncertainty, uncertainty. But what he's, he's getting at here, there's no end to all the people, to all who were before them, even the ones who will come later, who will not be happy with him, for this to his vanity and striving after win. If you're placing your faith in, in, in human leadership, in political systems, you're in, for, you're in for problems. That's what he's saying here. Fear, trust God rather than men, you know, uh, and, and this, you could apply this also to the vanity, uh, you know, why do you want to be king in the first place? In a lot of cases, for the praise and adoration of other people. Well, what he's telling, he's warning us here, that is a trap. And he's warning us here that the praise and adoration of people is very fickle. 
Can't you think of people that we thought were heroes? And, um, and then later, later you find out about all their personal life and how things uh, were pretty ugly. Um, I don't want to make anybody personally. I, one of my heroes growing up was Johnny Carson. He was from Nebraska. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, but then when you find out about all his personal life and all the uh, immorality and all the adultery and all the stuff that was going on, he was not a good role model. And there's other people that, you know, that we've thought, you know, were uh, good examples. And when you lift the rug, uh, it's not so good. But the point here is, Fear God and trust God because men are fickle. Right? Haven't we seen, maybe in your organizations or that you've worked in, the, the, the changing of the guard and how fickle things are? And uh, Well, when you look at man, a woman, you'll be disappointed if you put all your stock in a person and not in God, because I'm going to disappoint you. Yeah. And you're going to disappoint all of us. That's the warning tonight. That's the warning. Fear God and don't trust in men. And don't trust in the ad adoration or ad acclamation of, of men. That's the warning tonight. Because he says in verse 16, there's no end to all the people to all who were before them and the ones who will become later will not be happy with him, for this too is vanity and striving after wind. What do we do to our leaders, right? Two months after they get in, they're, they're, they don't know what they're doing. And, and uh, you know, it just gets worse from there, right? Yes, ma'am. I go to a church in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, and uh, in, in praying. The minister always says, um, I pray for, I can't want to say this ego, uh, not, not what I want, but what you want, dear Lord. May, may the person win who, who will be best for our country and not the person that I would like to have win. Yeah. yeah. Asking for God to intervene in our mm -hmm. elections. I agree with that. Steve. I spent several years uh, before coming here on a suburban school board in Houston, and it was interesting to me to see how the same people would be giving you all kinds of adoration in one case, but yet on a two months later, they'd all be mad at you. Same people, you know. It's a, yeah, but yeah. Their decks are fickle. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You could you could never please them. And it's a hard job being a leader, right? And that's the other thing this verse is telling us. Being a leader in a human institution is a hard business. Very fickle. But the warning here is if you're placing your faith in a political system or in a person or in a specific leader, like Sadie said, you're in for trouble. That's a lot, you know, fear God and live, live under God's rule. Um, Recognize human institutions, but realize the limitations of them. All right, so we've been warned. Now, listen, I told you we were going to jump back to uh, 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 3, verse 22. And we've heard this before, and he's going to say it again. Now, somebody tells you once, that's, okay, you know, we kind of take note of it. If somebody tells you twice, okay, oh, that's a little more important. Well, he's going to tell us about six or seven times through this book. And so here he goes again, verse 22. And I've seen that nothing is better than that man should be happy in his activities. Look at the next phrase. For that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? We don't know the future. We, you know, we can't know the future. God hasn't revealed that to us. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. There were things that happened today that we couldn't see coming. So, 
fearing God is living in contentment with what he's, the, you know, our lot, our situation, and, and being happy in his activities. And there's plenty to be unhappy about, right? We've talked about all this absurdity under the sun and the vanity under the sun. There's plenty to be unhappy about. We could go jump off the roof, uh, right? If we, if we let it take us to that point. And God says, trust me and live in this moment and enjoy what I've given you. And that's, that's a choice, right? That's a, that's a choice to fear God and to live like that versus other behaviors that we see around us here in an absurd and in vain world. Uh, I had a couple other scriptures I wanted you to look at uh, with me here. Uh, look at Psalm 16, verse 5 and 6. This is Psalm 16, uh, starting in verse 5. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. Thou dost support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. This somebody, this is somebody confessing what the preacher we just read over in Ecclesiastes 3. This is somebody making that confession. He's choosing, he's making a choice to be to trust God to be content in the madness and to be thankful for the lot that God has given him. Read it again. The Lord is a portion of mine inheritance of my cup. Thou dost support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. That's a choice. That's a faith statement. The other one I wanted to show you with, oh, the, the same theme comes out over in the New Testament. It's in 1 Corinthians 7. And Paul's talking to these folks. And um, now that I've become a Christian, do I need to be, do I need to be something else in society? I'll, I'll say it that way. Um, and the, I'm not going to read the whole discussion. It starts in, in verse 17 and goes to chat, uh, verse 24. Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each in this manner, let him walk. Okay? As God has assigned you your position in life, walk in that position. He, now, one of the issues here is if you're a slave, and I try to go get my freedom. And he basically says, if you have that opportunity, take it. But when he gets over to verse 20, he says, let each man remain in that condition in which he was called. Be content with the lot and the situation that God has called you to. That's, that's the point that Paul's making. And it's the same thing that the preacher's saying uh, back in Ecclesiastes 3. All right, tonight. So uh, we'll land the plane here. So, you know, another, we hit it again tonight, this idea of the brevity of life. So, you know, anybody in here, if you've not committed your life to Christ, if you've not repented, we don't know if we have tomorrow. So let this be the day. You know, trust God, fear God tonight. Fear God tonight and be saved. Um, next point I had here is, it, you know, I, I've already hit this one, but have you become numb to injustice? Is there something that God would have you, somebody God would have you to stand up for or intervene for, uh, for the sake of justice? Uh, you know, the other thing we talked about was work. So what's your approach to work as a recovering workaholic? Um, so what's your approach to work? Are you content with what you have? Or have you just got to have more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't have to be, you know, uh, my self-worth isn't tied to my net worth. Let me say it that way, okay? But, but uh, pray about these things this week. 
um, you know, uh, um, have you placed your faith in politics rather than God? Right. Well, you're gonna you're gonna run into some people this year who are gonna be pretty close to this. If we can just win this, if we can just get this person elected, then things are gonna be you know it's gonna you know everything's gonna be great. All we have to do is go to the mailbox. Yeah, yeah. I got I got uh, four or five in the mailbox today. Election flyers today, right? But you're gonna run into folks if you haven't already. They're pretty close to, to putting their faith in the political system and in individuals rather than God, trust in God. And then, the, you know, the last hit in our, our point that we talked about over and over again, have you thanked God for the lot he has given you? Uh, you know, I was praying this week and thanking God for the path he has taken me through. Can you look back, good and bad, and thank God for the lot he has given you to get you here? Even the hurtful times. Can you say thank you? Um, anything else that you get from the lesson tonight? I think it's I think it's interesting, you know, having a lot of us in here been around a long time. And I, I think that... Uh, it's interesting to see how some of the things that we thought were going to be disasters turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to us. I think that's time and time again, that's been the case. And it was probably the vice versa. Things you thought were going to be great that weren't so great. That's true. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And God uses all those things to get us to trust him. Show us that we're not we're not rowing the boat. Anything else tonight? Things you were verses that impressed you. Okay. I, I don't understand how some I mean they never even think of the brevity of life and life that they're going to be judged for anything. I just think they're going to just I guess just die and we'll never be held accountable for. God, God's just going to wink at those uh -huh. little problems that we had. When they die, they die and just, that's the end, nothing else. But Satan has fooled them. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe if I don't talk about eternity and a judgment, then maybe it won't happen, right? <laughs> If I, don't, if I just don't talk about it, maybe it's not really true. Right? Yeah. So yeah, you know, and well, like I said, you know, the preacher, the preacher at one point in here is going to tell us better to be in the house of mourning than to be in the house of laughter, because we have to confront this. We have to live in the fear of God every day, knowing that we're accountable. Right? All right. We'll close up. Now, next week, we're going to talk some more about this fearing God, and he's going to give us some more warnings. And the top of the list is false worship. I'm going to talk about false worship next week. All right. Great, Lord. We thank you for your word and for your truth, that your word is unchanging, just as you are unchanging. Thank you for your sovereignty and your grace that you have shown us through thick and thin. Thank you for your marvelous goodness to us, Lord, in Christ. Help us to walk out of here, Lord, in greater faith and in greater obedience to your word. Amen. Thank you, Damon.